My name is Eric Van Horn. I bought my first franchise in my 20s, and since then, I've owned six brands with 25 stores in eight states. I've also helped a thousand people find the right franchise for them. People like us who are not cut out for the nine to five and like to work smarter, not harder, how do we find the right franchise, buy it, grow it, sell it, and how do we do it in a way to own the business without it owning us? Those are the questions, and I'm on a mission to give you the answers. Welcome to Franchise Secrets. Welcome to the Franchise Secrets Podcast with your host, Eric Van Horn here, and I'm with Klaus Grimm, and we met in a hot tub in the Four Seasons Resort in Punta Mita, Mexico, um, randomly. Like I was there with a mastermind group. He was there with <laughs> his family, and, and uh, I was just talking franchises in my group, and he's like, hey, what do you mean franchises? And then we just started talking. I'm like, man, we got we to gotta get to know each other, and we need to get you on the podcast. So his background is a massage envy franchisee turned franchisor into hammer and nails. And I've got, we've got some mutual friends in that, in that system. And then he's a franchisor with a new like lemonade, acai bowl, healthy, quick serve, uh, natural type, healthy snack franchise. And so today we want to talk about what it's like going from a franchisee to a franchisor, because that's exactly what I'm in the middle of doing right now. And then also want to talk about just diversifying, having a diversified portfolio. He and I have both done that, and we want to talk about that. And then just a new franchisor pitfalls. Like what's, what are some of the pitfalls of these emerging brands or of, of a new franchisor? And then we also want to do some market predictions, like how smart are we and how, how wrong are we going to uh, get it? So context, we're like in the middle of the coronavirus or maybe in the beginning of it. We're two weeks into it. And so we want to see, we, we want to kind of talk about what we think is going to happen. But anyway, all of that to say, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Eric. Appreciate the opportunity. Life was sure different a few months ago when we were uh, like enjoying life, looking out over the ocean in beautiful Punta Minta. Yeah, it's uh, quite the change. Was it two months ago? <laughs> it was. Yeah. Yeah, to two months ago, celebrating a birthday. You were there with a the group, was there with family, and uh, who knew? I mean, we already knew about something is happening in China, but nobody really paid attention. It was attention. Not, even, not even on my radar. The word social distancing hadn't even, you know, that was not even termed yet. We were, we, life, was, life was good. Life was normal. But we all knew, even in that hot tub and, and talking, we all knew something was going to happen at some point with the economy. It wasn't sustainable. And so, like, smart people like you, were just just knew we we couldn't sustain it. So it was just a matter of time, a matter of when. And people like you and I know, like it's in these times where certain people fail and certain people succeed and 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 certain people thrive. So anyway, let's get into the to just give us a little bit of your overall background to set the context for everyone here. I was in the non franchise world before I had a company sold that to a deluxe corporation and Took a year off and, you know, and then I thought I need to find a business that uh, has uh, built in revenue, you know, residual revenue or membership or something. And came across an owner that had a massage in me that's moving out of town. And I was looking at this initially and I said, no, I wasn't convinced I want to do franchising. I'm one of those entrepreneurs that thinks you know, I know everything <laughs> better than, than the rest of the world, you know. But as I'm thinking about it, you know, as I was thinking about it, I, I sort of started liking the idea, uh, researched the model, and thought, you know, this this looks something I want to do. So I purchased my first one. It was an existing one in 2011. Loved the concept, you know, uh, loved that actually, you know, with one or two units, you can be sort of hands off, you know, work 10 hours a week uh, and enjoy a good life work balance. But like a lot of us entrepreneurs, you know, we're not happy with just one, especially for <laughs> franchise, right? You go, how do we have more? Yep. So I ended up buying a year later that franchisee out in Reno. So I live in Reno, Nevada. And with that, then owned all three in the Reno market. So I had that market. And I was thinking how else I can grow. And I, and I prefer what I call B markets, the smaller towns mm -hmm. like Reno, Boise, Fresno, Bakersfield. Because I do think those communities are a little bit tighter. They they support the local. 
you have a captive audience sort of in these smaller communities. So expanded into Fresno, bought a two pack and built two massage envies and opened them within a month of each other. The reason I did that is uh, I always think if you open one franchise in a town that doesn't have it, you're not, people don't really understand the scale of your business. Mm-hmm. You're just another onesie twosie owner. When you open two, they instantly get it. Go, oh, okay, this is bigger. This is for real. So, so with that, I uh, caught, I captured the market rather quick, um, and had really good membership growth. Then again, it was uh, nearby was a franchise, so I ended up buying them out. So now I was with six. Then I'm thinking, you know what? Let's let's keep going, and uh, ended up building. Um, so I had three in Fresno, three in Reno. Then went down in the I-99 corridor, uh, Visalia and Bakersfield. So. So within four years, I ended up having eight massage envies, becoming multi-unit franchisees. And that's obviously, there's no longer 10 hours a day of work. <laughs> a lot more to that then. But then I was thinking, you know, uh, may as well just buy more. And uh, was, was me trying to buy somebody out that had six, seven, eight units mm-hmm. and came across a private equity group that had the same idea, wanted to get into massage envy. And it uh, worked out well that we uh, combined our resources. You know, they, they bought me out, and that was in 2017. Typically goes, I stayed on for the transition, mm-hmm. and then I moved on. How long did you stay on for that transition? So I stayed on for six months. Okay. And then, so they bought your years out, and what was it like dealing with private equity? Because I think a lot of franchisees think about that. They want that. And, and I, we've had private equity buy out. One of my exits was private equity. But most of them were just franchisee, new franchisees or existing franchisees. So what was it like dealing with a private equity company wanting to buy you out? You know, it's, it's a little different. Obviously, you know, for us, um, single, I, you know, every, I, everything I financed was by myself. I didn't mm-hmm. have any investors. My wife and I owned 100% of the business. So now having somebody come in that uh, called OPM, that, you know, was yep. playing with other people's money, uh, has the resources to analyze, right? I learned so much about my own business during the negotiating. I almost yeah. didn't sell after all. I'm like, oh, wow, look what I could do. So, so that part was really uh, great. Uh, I did enjoy learning about the business from a different angle, you know, having uh, somebody to bounce ideas off and all that. So I think that was very good. In my case, they, are, they came from the food world. Mm-hmm. And the food world is, you know, Burger King is different than the massage Massage was about people touching yep. you know, uh, systems aren't working as well in that world as it works in the food world. Employees, you know, is uh, our employees are licensed mm-hmm. versus the food world. You know, you have unlimited <laughs> employees, essentially. So, so that's a philosophical change for that, you know. And um, so it was the first one. Was it the first non-food franchise that that private equity company purchased? For franchises, I believe so. They had they okay. had others like their own funeral uh, funeral homes and uh, uh, retail, yeah, a couple of retail, but um, nothing in the, in the in the human interaction. So no wonder they wanted you to stick around. Yeah, they like. I mean, this is really why I got into massage. I mean, too, I saw it as a as a bond. I mean, essentially, mm-hmm. it's you know you're you're getting a savings bond, you know, and and that's why private equities are coming into, especially a massage, I mean, mm-hmm. because of the uh, recurring revenue stream. Yep. You know, from the financial part, it was easy to explain, but how it really works, that, that was a little harder to uh, get them to understand why we can't just pick up employees. Yeah. You know, economy is yeah. good. Uh, licensed massage therapists become less and less because they found out of jobs. Uh, outside the industry, with that massage in me, had more competition, you know, massage heights. Uh, there were so many copycats that came up, right? Yep. So, so, so that, that part was a little harder and that. How would you set up your business differently, or what are the things that you did well setting up your business for a sale? So one thing that I and I still to date I believe is my business has to be run so I can sell it tomorrow. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of owners, uh, and maybe not so much in the franchise world because you are sort of corporate controlled, and there is a since you're paying uh, royalties and revenues. Right. There is a big brother watching the revenue, so you can't really be too creative. However, still, when I when I researched and I bought uh, massage envies, they would co-mingle with orange theories or mm-hmm. or European wax and right managers, you know, payroll co-mingling. 
And I never did that. You know, I yeah. always uh, believe in yep. operate as if you want to sell tomorrow, have your finances in order, because you never know when a sale comes. And then you can say, hey, give me a year. Yeah. Look, look the difference just now, selling in January between now. If you didn't have your act together, your sale is done. Nobody's yep. going to buy you now. Yeah. Right? That's a good point. I think so setting up your books and, and everything the right way, because when, when especially if it's private equity, that's like, they're like forensics, you know, they come in oh, and yeah. it's like their forensic accountant is like what they look at, what we are even thinking they look, look at is just a ton of information and how they want it. But then it goes back to their, to their company and they have a ton of people with eyes on it that are much smarter than most of us average franchisees. And and so it's a lot more work to to do that, um, but it it really it's going to give you a really clear picture of what your business is really doing because they need a clear picture like that. So I think that's really good advice. You know, there's one thing I want to also add to that is uh, make yourself replaceable. Yes. If the business is only successful because of you, it's not sellable. So I always had a strong COO, in knowing that if I had to step aside. Mm -hmm. You can run it smooth, you know, which makes your, your business more uh, sellable. Yep. Also, it allows you to take time off work. Yep. You're not in it constantly, right? So that for sure helped to knowing I can step away at any given day and the back uh, office is taken care of. Yep. That's an excellent point. And we did that when we sold our solo salons, we had somebody in there that was the face, really the face of the organization and, and, and. When you go to sell it, and that's why you probably only had to stay on for six months versus like 12 to 12 months to two years, because there, otherwise you would have to train up your replacement. Since you are headed right. in there, they just needed to make it was a, make sure it was a smooth transition. So that's an excellent point. And that's a reason to, to delegate and to delegate things for people to do, not, not just tasks, but delegate like roles, have that be their role, hire people that are smarter than you. Even if you're really good at operations. Have somebody that's even better than you at operations running yeah. running the show. They might be better than you or have more experience than you in that, but they're they're working for you. They don't have the entrepreneurial drive to be able to 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 and the risk level to be able to do it. So there's going to be and especially now in today's environment, dude, we're going to be oh, we are so prediction time. Interrupt. Let's take it. Let's make a prediction, which is not much, but. There's going to be some really good talent available for people oh, out yeah. there to hire. That's coming and and grab them. Even if you know, I want to say we can't afford them, but this is there's just a, an opportunity to pick up really good talent, and they should be tie them into your company somehow to give equity or something like that, so they can so they can grow with you and they're tied in there with you. Hundred percent. There's going to be a ton of opportunities available. There's going to be prime real estate available because mm -hmm. not everybody's coming out of this. And if they're not strong enough, developers, shopping center developers, they, you know, that have good locations, they don't mind if somebody says, hey, I'm done. Say, that's fine. Just, just leave because they can find tenants. So I think there's going to be prime real estate available. I do think we're going to see some long, you know, let, let's take a subway. A subway has been bleeding franchi you know, franchisees for quite a while. Yep. It could be that some of these older, I don't say subway is outdated, but some of the, the brands that are outdated could bleed a lot more than others where people go, I'm done. I'm not going to reopen. All right. Yep. So uh, for the ones that will open is less competition. Yep. I do think some of the emerging brands, you know, the franchisors may not make it you know, where they have to shut down. Yep. Um, Let's talk about that. Let's go there right now because I just got off the phone with a friend of mine and he's like, Eric, what are you doing? Is there going to be so many opportunities? I'm like, I know. So what I'm doing, and it's, it's just a continuation of what I've already started, but creating a group of investors that are flush with cash and weren't all in in the market. So they didn't experience a 30, 30 to 40% dip at where we are right now. So they have the cash, they want to invest, and they know opportunities are going to be coming up. Well, I'm the guy that has access to opportunities, and you are a guy that has access to opportunities because franchisors, they go to you, they go to me because of, because of our influence in the franchising world. So I'm already getting those phone calls. And franchisors, the ones that, let's say franchisees out there, if you're part of an emerging brand right now, and you're like, I don't know if they're going to have enough money to weather the storm. Let's go down to the worst case scenario. Let's say 
they, the founders didn't have enough money to weather this storm. That franchisor is just not going to go away. It just doesn't cease to exist. There are going to be people like me or you that come in and say, there's value here in these franchisees. And I will grab that company and put infrastructure in place with financial backing so that brand can grow. And it'll probably grow even better with new, found, new owners in there that have franchising experience and have the capital to be able to do it. And so I would, I would argue if that does happen, that that fran- young emerging franchisor that the owners went belly up, there's a new, new sheriff in town that is really going to be franchisee focused and take that brand to where it needs to go. That's, that's what I'm looking for right now. I made some notes before the call, you know, so I, I, I remember, I remind myself that this is actually one of the notes where uh, some of the pitfalls of startup uh, franchises, you know, for the franchisor. And one thing we see sometimes they give away too much equity too fast. So now they have, let's say, five units open, 10 units open, but they only own 10 or 15% because the rest is for this, this, here, there. So now there isn't much equity for sale. Mm-hmm. Right. And they're gonna have a harder time than people. Let's, you know, my business partner John and I, we own the majority of our franchises, so right, of our systems. We have plenty of equity to distribute for cash, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a lot easier for guys like us to raise money mm-hmm. than for um franchisors that are so fractioned into 10, 15, 20 ownership groups mm-hmm. where you just can't, it's too complicated, right? Yep. And one of the advisors I always give everybody is don't, you said earlier, hey, give some equity to uh, uh, to some of this talent. You know, I, I'm i very skimpy with handing out equity. You well, know, you don't uh, have to give out big equity. So I'd love to hear right. your your opinion on that. So yeah, I would love to love to hear what your thoughts are on that. For instance, at Hammer and Nails, none of the employees have equity, uh, but that's so that came from how we bought it and how it- uh, And we, let's just set the stage for who it is. It's you- so, so John, Joy, and I, we are at, at Hammer and Nails. He is the majority partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's over 50%. I'm under 50%. At Wow Wow, you know, we're equal partners. So essentially, we own 50 50. No outside money. It's mm-hmm. our own money. You know, so it makes things easier for us to grow. And when we uh, started Wow Wow, uh, the CEO that we hired, so both of them, we have a CEO, <clears throat> you know, that they, they run it. And, but we are both actively involved in it. We're not just investors walking away. We 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 yeah. do a frequent conference calls and we're in the weeds of things. But but wow, we decided uh, for Tim because he actually was a, is a Wawa franchisee to give him equity because he's the CEO. He's gonna grow that. You know, he is, he believes in it, and mm-hmm. we want him to grow with us, right? Yep. Uh, him and Neil's is a slightly different model, but I'm sure we're heading there once our COO moves up that there's equity available for them. But other than that. We feel in the, in the first round of money raising, typically after you have 25, 30 open, you're going to need you know a significant influx of money. And we want to have enough shares available uh, for a private mm-hmm. equity group to grow with us at yep. that point. Did you ever give equity as a franchisee or phantom equity to really no. good em- employees? Do you know no. people that did that and had good or bad experience with that? Uh, I know people that did and had really bad experience, and I can tell you, previous owner of Hammer and Nail, that entrepreneur, you know, he gave away, you know, to their to his main employees, and then there was a nightmare afterwards. I think employees uh, are get. I much rather have an employee, um, and and people, my my staff knew that I would surprise them with uh, gifts or or mm-hmm. cash outside the ordinary, even they're, if they're good employees or yep. big bonuses. Not Christmas, just random. Mm-hmm. You know, at times, yeah. um, much rather uh, uh, give them money then, especially this generation now that the, the younger generation, they don't really see the the upside long term. Can't yeah. even give commissions or quarterly bonuses anymore because they don't think that far. They want yep. two day money. Right. Yep. So I think money paid today is more important to them than equity. Yeah. That's a great point too, because it's about, you got to know who your people are, who, what motivates them. Cause I had a, an employee that was working for us that, you know, he wanted to own and he left us to own and yeah. he's a great guy and, and he did it. And if we would have given him equity. We would have made more money when we sold it than, than we would have otherwise. But if you give equity to the wrong people and I'm, again, I'm not talking about a large amount of equity. I'm talking a smaller piece of equity. 
for the person that that's really good for. But yeah, so that that's good discussion. So let's go back to that transition from a franchisee to franchisor. Like what was what motivated you? Because all of us franchisees think that at some yeah. point. I could do it better than my franchisor. I can do this. I can do that. And then there I a lot of my friends now are have made that transition. They own franchisors now and they're doing really well. Like I'm super proud of them to the point that I'm like, why not me? And so I'm in the middle of starting up a roofing franchise to put roofs on people's heads when they get damaged from storms or it's time to replace it. And so I'm in the, you know, the tail end of doing that. You've done that. What was the motivation for you to do that? And what was the process like for you? When, when I sold, you know, it was about, for about a year, I, you know, I sort of looked around what to do and I didn't want employees anymore, but I want to be active. Mm -hmm. So John and I, John at that point had a hammer and nail franchise and we we're talking and he said, you know, Klaus, this is so backwards. You know, we got to order this fancy Buffalo leather chair. It takes six months to make blah, 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 this, this, and this. Why don't we just buy, right? So, so we looked at it and we thought, you know what? Uh, makes sense. Yeah, the the original Michael Elliott, the original founder, just couldn't grow it much. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of entrepreneurial mistakes that, that, that are typical for visionaries. You know, that uh, are not detail driven. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were looking at it, and we liked the brand. It met my personal guidelines of membership based. Yep. And um, uh, scalable. Mm -hmm. We just had to make 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 some adjustments, right? And it was also an emerging um, it was an emerging brand, but also new to the industry, right? It wasn't another burger joint or another uh, gym. Yep. This is hair barber uh, pedicure manicure for men. Uh, I mean, women are welcome too, but there's no no, no painting nails, right? So um, I thought, you know what? This is a trend. Uh, men's grooming is a huge trend. It keeps uh, uh, evolving, mm -hmm. and we need to be part of it. So I really like that. You know, I know we're still early, and you've got others like Floyd's and Diesel that are doing barbering only, yep. but you can see that men's grooming now is really evolving in its own industry because yep. men are sort of tired of going into women's salon, right? And they want to be, they want to have a beer maybe drink, watch sports, you know, have a headset on, maybe not make conversation, whatever it is. So I liked that. And I thought this is good. The investment wasn't too bad, really, yep. for a good quality name. They were in Shark Tank. Uh, so so overall, we thought this is, this is a, a good thing. We bought it, immediately hired a quality COO. Uh, we ran it and we've been doing very well with it. Well, I think that's important. Let's pause there. Quality COO, because what's what are your strengths? What are your partner strengths? Like, if you boil it down into just like, what are you really good at? Your zone of genius. What's your your strength and your partner's strength? My partner is by trade a CPA. He had a CPA firm, but he's an entrepreneurial CPA, so that's he's very, really good. That, at numbers. That's a unique <laughs> skill set right there. Check the contracts. You know, attention to detail. That's him. I'm the guy that looks down from 50,000 feet to things outside the box, uh, never sort of go mainstream and think about growth. For me, it's always forward. Yeah. Always forward. I, I was a soccer player. I was a forward and a goalie. I would never pass back ever. It's always going <laughs> forward, 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 right? And so Are you I, so still I, doing I, that I, today? Are you still doing that today? I quit playing soccer about 10 years ago and I started biking, triathlons, uh, uh, race, road race, criterium, stuff like that's that. That's right. That's right. Uh, as we get older, you know, I don't... <laughs> it changes. But you're that going forward guy, 50,000 foot. You got, you got the attention to the detail, the contracts, the CPA that is entrepreneurial. You're the 50,000 foot visionary and can see where you want this thing to go. And that's like a lot of us that are listening to this, that's who we are. We are the visionary and we've been put in this box of franchising and we think, and, and we want, we want more. And so you brought in a COO. That's exactly mm -hmm. what we're going to do in the roofing business. Cause we were all, you know, there's a, a few of us partners and it, we're, we're going to go crazy. We're all going to do little, little thing here, little there, but we need somebody that is like driving the ship, that, that is the captain. Right. And I see that mm -hmm. as the CEO or COO, um, the per operational, somebody that's yeah. operational. It doesn't matter. You know, those titles could be interchangeable if you wanted to, 
but I think the COO is, is going to be our first outside hire. And so when you look at hiring that COO and franchisees, you can look at this with your, within your own franchise business as well, because you need to hire a similar type person to, to be that district operational manager or somebody. But dive into like, who was it? How did you find them? And what did you want them to do? That's also a massage and we hired a COO, you know, yep. uh, someone that's good with detail. So we had an opportunity at the point, uh, his name is Aaron, and Aaron was a VP of sourcing and logistics uh, at FedEx, then uh, moved because the FedEx guy was a CEO at Massage and we moved to Massage and we eventually, you know, he, he, he created all the infrastructure, you know, they downsized a little bit or replaced, I'm not quite sure what happened, but he was available to us. So we hired him. So he has years of logistics experience, years of franchise experience, uh, understands the players, the, uh, the vendors, mm -hmm. uh, systems, and uh, great hire, right? So he's been with us now with two years. And uh, one of those key positions, obviously, uh, for any good uh, uh, franchise systems, you got to have that. Yep. And typically, startup franchises, they don't really want to hire that sort of because there is a financial commitment. Mm -hmm. However, somebody's got to deal with the details, especially in our world, you know. Um, yep. So uh, C COO and then uh, the next thing was an assistant and uh, then obviously a uh, VP of sales. So why did you hire an assistant? I think that's a very good mm -hmm. move. Cameron Harold, you know, um, he's a COO whisperer. He's a big fan of hiring an assistant. I have an executive mm -hmm. assistant and, um, and my executive assistant is available to other people on my team to utilize as well. So why hire an assistant? I'm going to take a minute on this. I have this philosophy and I, I would always teach it to my direct reports. I say there's people that are really good at $10 in our jobs. Mm -hmm. Some at 25, some at 50 and us as owners, we're the hundred dollar an hour jobs. So mm -hmm. If I get paid $100 an hour and I need to do $10 an hour job, I'm losing $90 yep. every hour. So that's my perspective. Other people are saying, well, but I'm losing $10 an hour paying somebody else. I'm like, no, 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 no. No, you're gaining $90 an hour. So with that, if there are things that we can sub out for some that can do it better, more efficient, for less money that frees us up yep. to think big, and uh, work uh, on the business, not being in the business, that to me is priceless. So uh, in both of our franchise systems, both Wawa and Hammer and Nails, we've got a CEO, CEO, and assistant, and we have one shared uh, that uh, represents our sales for both systems, you know, uh, so a VP of sales or franchise development. So I think what you just said there, just to unpack that a little bit more, leaders are always teaching. If you're a leader, you're always teaching. So what you did, what the, you just went into that teaching mode. And I think every one of us franchisees should be looking at that with our team. Just don't tell them what to do or, or, you know, tell them why you're doing what you're doing and teach them. And that's leadership. So many, I think, in, that are owners, just they think they're an owner and they just delegate, delegate, delegate. But if you're not teaching, you're not leading. So you need right. to teach, you need to teach your team. And what you just did there, I mean, think about this. Um, if it's a 20, my, my assistant, I think is $25 an hour. She's, you know, that's what she does. And she, she, she does a lot for me. She's going to be doing $25 work. I don't want her doing $10 an hour work. Right. I want her to go out and find the $10 an hour people and have them do $10 an hour work. And a lot of that is outsource stuff to different countries or whatnot. So like she can be managing a team of outsourced people or whatever it is. And then she knows that my team, I, I, my, like Michael, he's, you know, he's the guy that, that does so much on social media for me. And he's my right hand man. I'm like, Michael, you're making this much money. If, if, if you're spending 10 hours doing whatever it is, and you can, if you can spend a little bit of time to set up some systems and processes and outsource all this podcast stuff or all the content or the video editing and all of that, then do it. Even if it, you know, and so I'm always like that, Klaus, teaching my, my people my mindset as a leader, because if I don't teach them how I think, then they're just going to be doing things how they think, and the organization is going to be, is not going to be, you're not really leading. 
You're just, they're, they're right. just, they're just little people. They're just um, people out there doing their jobs. And I want people to do things the way that I would want to do it. I want them to think like, how would Eric do this? How would Eric make a decision like this? So um, excellent leadership. I like that. I just had to get off on, on that little tangent because when you said, I'm going to teach you, I'm like, Ooh, that's, that's good. So I just wanted to like, let everybody know, like that's leadership. And that's what people need right now. Hey, it's Eric here. I hear from a lot of people that they're looking to buy their first brand or maybe their second or third brand, and they're not sure where to start, or they're not sure if they're looking in the right places. Well, that's where I come in. I help people find really good brands. And if you're thinking about your second or third, or maybe your first brand, let's set up a time to talk. You can go to talkwitheric.com. That's E-R-I-K, talkwitheric.com. Now back to the show. If your employees understand, they say, hey, you're not stuck at this 25. My goal is that you're going from 25 to 50 and then 50 to 100. And then for me, from 100 to 1,000, right? There's always a push, again, forward, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, they see what's ahead of them. Uh, They are not working outside the comfort zone. Because you put in a $10 to a $25 job, they may not know. They may not have the skills quite yet. The flip side yeah, we know you can do it. You know, I can do $10 an hour work, but probably not as good as that person because yep. I'm going to miss things, right? Um, it, we just all have different skills. So respect those skills, respect the pay, and always have them move forward and understand there's a ladder they can climb up. We want them to. With that, that's the next thing. Always have a bench. You've got yes. to, especially in the franchise world, if you're a multi-unit franchisee, you've got to have a bench. You know, uh, if you don't have a bench, you are being held hostage by your managers. Yeah, that's a good point. And we're going to talk about diversification, but I think this is, yeah. a, this is the ability to be able to diversify. And that's why you want to get to multiple locations sooner than later, because you're able to have that bench. You're able to grow from within and you're able to have somebody that can step into the COO role if you're COO, like mine did, left me to go start his own franchise, which by the way, I love him and, and he's a good friend of mine, but that's what he did. And we didn't have anybody that could step into his place. And, and he had yeah. to find his replacement, which he did because he's an amazing man. And that's the loyalty that he had to us as owners. But the point of it is like, you always need to have somebody else that can step in, whether it's a store manager or a trainer or whatever, whatever that is. So building your bench. So anything else you'd want to add to that? But you know, what I learned as a franchisee and then as a multi-unit franchisee, which is a difficult really yeah. uh, task to, to own more than I mean, you think three, two are hard, you know, try five, right? Yep. And then you always have this scaling problem going on, right? Yep. Now, now I need a CEO, but if I have a CEO, I may as well have 10, right? Yep. To dilute the seven. It is a constant game from one to a hundred, essentially, or more. But the skills I learned as a multi-unit franchisee come in so handy now as a franchisor, because the system you learn the systems and you understand how to uh, implement it. Mm-hmm. You understand the impact across the board. What's good yep. for one, so this is really good for the other, right? The individualization of your owners. Uh, there's so many things we can take uh, with us compared to the people that are starting something that did really well. And then you open a second and a franchise. They've never been exposed to what it means when you have 10, 15, 20, 100, 1,000 units, yep. right? It, it's a whole whole different world. You know, it's, it's I mean, you and, you, you and I know it's hard to explain why, uh, but it's a people business and uh, you've got to have the best talent uh, available with that the best talent will grow from within. Let's talk about just diversifying in general. You've, yeah. you, you diversified, you're diversified as, yes. a, as a franchisor now and, um, as franchise, oh, this is interesting too. Like as a franchise, I remember my first franchise, franchisors don't want you to diversify. You know, your franchisor wants you to double down and double down again and to continue right. to grow, if, especially if you're good. But then I think if you're smart, you're always thinking about diversifying. So just talk about diversifying right now. Because yeah. I, when I think about diversifying, for me personally, that's why I went out of retail into service-based business that was a need-based business. And I, I still want to keep my, keep, you know, do both because they both, there's going to be so much opportunity. Oh my gosh. So much opportunity coming up in, in retail businesses right now for people to buy out other franchisees. Cause I just, it just went in the Facebook group. Someone asked a question, do I double down 
or do I fold? You know, some people are going to be doubling down and some people are going to be folding. So the people that are doubling down are going to be buying out the people that fold. So there's a lot of opportunity that are, that's coming up in retail, but also I see people that are in retail right now wanting to diversify into other retail aspects or into service-based businesses. So what's, what's your, why did you do what you do? Are you happy with it? And just some advice yeah. on diversifying. And I'm going to take the diversifying to another level that as we're talking about. You so, had to one-up me, didn't you? The, well, <laughs> well, I think you'll know what I'm referring to as soon as I get to it. Um, <laughs> so when we bought a uh, hammer and nail, so we're in the, in the men's grooming space, barber, haircut, right? That particular model already came with an AR, RD, you know, area representative, regional developer model, right? Yep. It came with that model. So so we we stuck with that, right? And uh, top of it, it's a membership model. So we've got grooming with membership and an AR model. So as we're looking, so John and I, we, you know, we have a, a essentially a franchise LLC, and our goal is to have more brands under that. So, so the next brand can't be in the same space. It can't be in beauty, grooming, or anything. So we decided, let's look in uh, uh, food, but what we call simple food yep. operation. Or if you don't want a Taco Bell, full kitchens, or any of that, right? Yep. So that's where we came across Wow Wow. Wow Wow is in the fast surf space, healthy. Again, mm -hmm. you know, it's emerging, but it's different. But we decided no ARRD model. Right to diversify mm -hmm. from the other model. Let's see yep. which one works, you know, better. Yep. Uh, and it's not a membership either, right? And your clientele is entirely different. So uh, these are either your millennials or your families versus men, right? So we literally in, in all the aspects we diversified. Uh, the, and the next thing we just said, hey, the way Hammer and Nail was set up, it's a nationwide. Anybody anywhere could buy a franchise as long yep. as they're qualified, right? Yeah. Miami, New York, Seattle, LA. That's how it was set up. We learned from says, hey, let's not be everything to everybody. Yeah. Let's just be spe geographic specific. Let's just do California, Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, right? Because it's not the area development model and the, fran the young franchisor can support those franchisees better. Is that the reason? Exactly, because it is impossible to service uh, when you have 15 units open and they're all over the country. It yeah. is so difficult to do that, <laughs> right? Uh, but that's how Hammer and Nails was set up when we purchased it. So yeah. it, it's hard to go back. On and a not only that, it's hard as a franchisor to reject people that want to give you money and be a franchisee in another state. So it, it's difficult to say no to that, too. It is. And I think this is where coming from the franchisee world, John and I understood that it is money taken from someone that we know cannot afford to operate yep. is going to hurt you, not just in the long run, but in the short run, yep. because it will result in closures. Yep. And you and I know we don't want closures in our FTDs, right? No. I mean, we're stuck with franchisees that were that did not have the money uh, to run it. They were didn't have the financing. They were just given a franchise because they paid their franchise fee. Right. Mm -hmm. We learned from that, uh, and we never just took anybody. We stick with quick qualifying. Here's your net worth. Here's this. We're rigorous about sticking to it because those franchisees that you get, we know, are going to uh, be in for the long term. Yep. And um, and being geographic, again, and we talk about diversifying, one system is everywhere. One is more uh, geographically uh, specific. You know, so, so we're learning right now from all of it. And, and uh, we then will implement uh, best practices at the systems we have, yep. both at Hammer and Nail and at um, um, Wawa. Also broker versus non-broker yep. sales, right? We're broker friendly. But uh, at uh, Wawa, we haven't really signed up with uh, entrepreneur stores or, or any of the other systems mm -hmm. quite yet versus uh, Hammer and Nails where we have, right? Yep. We're, we're trying to figure out, do we have to? Is it, is it best just uh, being digital? Uh, any broker that brings us deal, of course, we, we pay them. You know? uh, I would say you don't have to be in the system yep. to uh, bring a deal. Right? We still pay them uh, their whatever it is. 40 50 percent or so we're learning we're experiencing you know what's working what's not working you know we're young enough uh, where we can do that i think it's smart to to do that too i mean just 
just like growing, growing slow in the beginning because let's face it, like we're, we're starting the roofing franchise. We would love to have a hundred franchisees, but is that really what's best for the franchisees to go from a handful to a hundred? And it's really not. And, and right. we all think growth is great, but you know, we are holding ourselves back and we're bringing in some friends and some family and people that really want to do it and have the skill set to be able to do it and have the capital to be able to do it, even though it's not really expensive. What our offering to franchisees, it won't be that much. But still, they need to have fine. They need to be able to weather the storms like we're going through right now, where right. it doesn't affect them, where they don't think like I need to fold because this this is really not going to impact the roofing business, you know, especially with storms and things like that. But it might be something else that impacts it. There's always going to be some type of outside threat that could impact your business. So we want our our, our franchises to be financially well qualified. And then we want to learn from them because the, you know, like the, that's what I was going to say earlier. Let's face it. The franchisor is learning as, as the franchisee group grows because we're right. learning how to build the systems and to help our franchisees better. Because if you're the first, you know, 10 to 20 franchisees in any system, the system's going to be different when it's 50 to a hundred franchisees, you might get a bigger territory or this or more attention from the founder or whatnot in the beginning, but it there's a lot of benefit to come on later if the if things have already been learned and KPIs are different or better or systems and processes are different or better and we've learned things from that from the initial franchisee group. So I think it's really smart to grow small and then like what you're doing regionally where you can have where you can support those franchisees. If someone needs to go out there, drive there, fly well drive in today's environment. But, but fly there to get there quickly, they, they can. So uh, yeah, and, and it's hard. We see a lot of, I see a lot of franchisors that just want to go big because last month there's a bunch of private equity that was really willing to throw a lot of money at a lot of these franchisors. And I think that world has changed or is changing. And now I, I like this, Klaus. I like where I think we are heading in franchising, which is franchisee focused. Too many franchisors out there were trying right. to like, can I get, can I squeeze an extra dime out of my franchisee? Now it's right. like, how can I support my franchisees? And not all are going to do that, but the good ones are. And, and I'm hoping what comes out of this whole coronavirus thing are franchisees, franchisors are more appreciative of their franchisees and give more to their franchisees and, and want to help them. So in other words, just franchisee focus. And it sounds like that's how you're creating your franchises from the beginning. Yeah, you know, we learned, uh, uh, it's no secret, we learned massage envy, right? There's, it, it was overbuilt. And with that, you know, and, and as you grow, you know, the location was good 15 years ago is no longer a good location, right? Yeah. So there had to be, you know, some reshuffling, you know, territories or closures. It, and I think when you have too many, there's a diminishing ROI for a franchisor mm -hmm. where uh, the franchisee is, is becoming unhappy. Yep. Uh, it, it, it becomes a very them versus us environment. Yeah. You know, we, we're trying to avoid that. You know, we yeah. really want to make sure that uh, because we come from a franchisee world, we're mm -hmm. franchisee friendly. Uh, they need to make money. When they make money, everyone's happy. Yep. And uh, for us to, instead of having 10 stores in a big city, maybe only seven stores to a franchisor, this isn't that much of a difference financially, but to the franchisees, it makes a huge difference uh, when you don't overbuild. And when they are ha when they make that money, right, they will appreciate. It becomes uh, uh, working together, and you see that with a lot of smaller uh, franchise systems. Yeah. When there's 50, 100, 200, they're all a family. You hear that? Now you're starting to grow, and it grows apart, and some of them are failing. Yeah. Right? I mean, you'll see big systems that are that are, are, are diminishing, right? And it just got too big. Yep. Yep. And and competition starts coming in and I mean it gets uh it gets tough. Yeah. You know? So we, we gotta grow smart. Yep. We gotta grow slow, not too slow. Uh, but we don't wanna have a hundred all of a sudden next year. We it's impossible to service that. You know, the yeah. infrastructure is not there. It is. And and it's just it's just not quality for the franchisees. Do you have anything else that you want to share with the group? Anything from, you know, what we've talked about to add a little color on it or just kind of predictions that we see coming up? 
Anything, anything else before we wrap things up? People ask me, what's a good franchise? And I, uh, a lot of time, and obviously I say, hey, look at ours. But Well, let's stop right there. How do people find your franchise? So, so actually, it's a really great question because we used to do like, you know, you know, what a lot of people do, hey, go on Facebook, hire social media, mm-hmm. ad agency, right? And they're going to do Facebook ads, X, Y, Z. And we got thousands of leads. None of them are qualified. <laughs> Right. No. So uh, I was a little bit on the sideline and then uh, I jumped in last year and I said, hey, John, th- you know, uh, we're not there's no leads. I mean, there's mm-hmm. no quality of leads. We yeah. can't get them through qualification. What's wrong? So he says, hey, can you jump in and take that part of the business over? So I start interviewing agencies. Right. Mm-hmm. And the majority goes, hey, we're Google one partner, this, this <laughs> algorithm, blah, blah, blah. Right. Uh, and there is hundreds of those oh, out yeah. there. But when it comes to substance, where you go, okay, uh, how do you, how, can you look at this comprehensively, not just getting out the ad? Mm-hmm. There's very few. So we select this, and this is probably a plug for them, but they have done absolutely fabulous. We talked to Dawn at Hot Dish. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so we're chatting back and forth. And I told her about our system, this and this. She goes, yeah, but you know, it's going to be a three, four, five month process mm-hmm. to get everything in place, this, this, and this. And we started with them in May last year. And our ads started in January. We got the back end right. We totally recreated our uh, franchisee site um, mm-hmm. that explains, you know, your minimums, this, that. It was a lot more user friendly, easy to understand, very visual, not, not a lot of text. Mm-hmm. And we went live in January within two weeks. Which is great. We had uh, there were more leads, but eighty-seven of them were qualified candidates, and twenty percent of them were serious. And we had, I think, six or eight from that come to our first. I mean, we we stopped doing discovery days uh, in the fall, yeah, because why bother? We want to make sure they're qualified. Yep. And once we had discovery, I think we had six or eight out of that coming to discovery day, and actually our dis- our discovery day closure rate was tenfold what we used to have. So worked really, really well. Obviously, also doing for Wawa. Wawa, mm-hmm. we saw the same situation. And that was just in the first month, is meaning we haven't really sorted through the details yet, what's working, what's not working. This was the first specific approach uh, with them. Uh, we got the back end in order first. So uh, this is working very well for us. Uh, right now, we're pausing it because nobody is buying. We're going to pause it for two or three weeks, and then we start ramping up again. I think that's smart. Just everyone listening, how that applies to your own business is there are so many people that claim like the the more noise that that you're out there, the bunch of Facebook ads and these things, if Mm. it doesn't have the right messaging, which most don't, and most agencies uh, say that they do, they have the secret sauce, and most don't. Like my friend Brian, the co-host over at the uh, franchise story podcast with me, like he's legit. They are, they work on the messaging and get things right. And very few companies out there do that. It's just a me too. And that's why, like when I tell people about buying franchises, you don't just open up a magazine to see what it is. You don't just look at ads on Facebook and you just don't, that's, that's all a bunch of noise. The real deals, the real, the real things you find through friends and working with people like me and just, you know, and listening to people like you on podcasts, you're like, that makes a lot of sense. So no, that's, that's really good. Any last bits of wisdom before I, uh, I totally interrupted you there. So I will not interrupt you. I promise. Another uh, piece of wisdom, especially after we come out of this, like we talked earlier, there's going to be some prime real estate uh, available. Don't, what I suggest to people is don't get set on a on a franchise. Say, I'm going to do X, mm-hmm. and I'm going to look for a location for X. Find the location and talk to your realtor and say, hey, what would be great in that location? He goes, well, coffee, food, uh, home service, or health, or have them, depending where mm-hmm. that is. And then, put, then find a franchise that meets those yep. criteria and put it in that location. Yep. Because... We all know location, location, location. Uh, we're also real estate developers. So I tell people, find the place and then find the concept. That's good. And I like that. Be- I, I would just add, don't um, don't get married to that location. Use that as a 
as a base to kind of see what the market needs because your real estate guy on the ground knows what the, you know, has an indication of what the market needs. And so that's great advice. Here's another piece of advice. When you go to a franchisor, you're talking to, you know, Wow Wow, Aussie and Lemonade, and you're like, hey, I've got this great location that I want to put one of your franchises in. When someone hears that on the franchise mm-hmm. development side of things, they're thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be a pain getting this guy through. So don't lead with that. Just say, hey, I was out looking at real estate. So this is the way not to do it. Don't say, I've got the great location. I want to see if I can buy a franchise of X there. Don't do that. Do do it this way. Hey, franchisor, I was out doing some market research. I was talking to some leasing agents and they said, this type of business would be great in in my market. I would love to learn more about your particular franchise. Those two different ways to say it. The second one will get you uh, will get you some some brownie points with that per, with that franchise, and they will engage with you a lot faster and better than doing it the first way. Yeah. Now there is. I think we're gonna we we're gonna relearn a lot of things, and we all have to have an open yep. mind to do things differently when we come out of this uh, economic crisis, which yep. I think will be short term. The market will stay liquid. This is not a financial crisis. Yep. The loans will be available. I think buying power will come back rather quick. Uh, I don't think we're looking at anything like we saw in 2008. It's different. Yeah, because the gov- there's going to be as, as quickly as it came, the government's going to be pumping money because they want right. business owners out there paying rent so they can so the landlords can pay their bills and the business can pay their employees. And that's how the economy keeps going. So um, I'm with you on that. So, man, thanks for coming on. I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for having me, Eric. Maybe see you in Mexico again. Uh, Let's do it. Let's randomly meet there again. That's the place to be. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com. 